Very good. Yeah, they're good. Okay. Wow. Wow. You'd think we've never done this before, Giancarlo, but 10 minutes in, uh, go to webinar is finally behaving properly. So, okay. Looks like we're good. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize, guys, for the confusion. Not sure what happened. Um, we are here. Let's get started with this. Um, Giancarlo, we've got a lot to, to talk about here, so let me do this. Um, from the perspective of what's been going on in Q4, quite a bit, right? We, we introduced the Channel Partner Program, um, which from a sales and marketing perspective, I think has been really beneficial to people and we're learning a lot and we're getting a lot of very positive comments on it. Um, so I wanna point out that if you guys haven't been joined that yet, please do, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about this. Uh, next thing, um, all of the, the, the development team has working, been working really hard on some things like network troubleshooting, some integrations, and we'll talk about that today as well. So all this being said, Giancarlo, let's get into this network troubleshooting, right? As part of the channel partner program, this is in beta for quite a while. Um, we have now released it so that everybody can see this. And Giancarlo, if you want, I can uh, show on my screen uh, first, but then maybe you'll want to uh, take over some things. Yep. With respect to where we start this, right? If you go to the monitoring dashboards, you guys should see the ability to either create a network troubleshooting table, or if you have one that's brought up already, if you've been playing with this, you will see this. A couple of the key things that you will note in this network troubleshooting. Um, one, this doesn't tell you how to use GoToWebinar, unfortunately. If it did, we might've been solving this problem faster. But one thing it does do, and I think one of the first things that I really like is this IP address conflict thing. I mean, Giancarlo, do you want to speak to a little bit about how this works? And I will be happy to demonstrate. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks, JP, for pointing that out. So the IP conflict detect is a mechanism that allows the Domots uh, user to identify if on a specific network, there are at least two different entities let's say let's call them entities because it might be the same physical device but two different entities identified uniquely by the mac address which are using basically the same ip address so just to give an example of an issue i, I was personally having at home uh, for an unknown reason my irobot was using uh, the HTTP ip address which is fine but one of my iPhones was set on a static IP address. So whenever the iPhone was using that same IP address of the iRobot, the iRobot was stopping working and nobody knew why it was not connected to the Wi-Fi anymore. But Tomot told me at a certain point, you have an IP conflict between the iRobot and the iPhone, which was, was great. So basically we identify every single device uniquely by the MAC address. And if we spot at a certain point, that two different MAC addresses use the same IP address, it might be uh, an IP conflict. And I say might be, not it's an issue, because there are some devices that has two different network interfaces, yep. which might have at a certain point, you know, the same IP address for uh, balancing or for hot, hot backup, okay? So if we did, and, and the, the, the detect that you, it's showing in your table, JP, is basically that one. I just uh, basically ungroup two interfaces for the purpose of showing this one. Uh, so when you look at, the, uh, at, at that identification, the last one, basically, the last one are two different, um, yeah, two different network interface of the same device, which is a, a touch panel. One is yep. the Wi-Fi, uh, um, Ethernet, uh, Wi-Fi, a network interface, the other one is the Ethernet interface, the wired one. Uh, what Domots allows you to do to say, okay, yes, there is, technically speaking, there is an IP conflict, but it's not causing any issue because they are part of the same physical device. You can group those two devices together. So right. that basically it reverts the IP conflict column to be no conflicts. Yeah. I mean, one of the challenges we see Giancarlo with IP address conflicts, right? And the reason that we felt this was so important is because it absolutely affects network behavior, right? When you have two different systems 
that have IP addresses in, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, right, of, the, of our audience, they know this. But one of the key things is that if we can detect that and give you awareness, but more importantly, Giancarlo, I think if we can tell you what are the two or more devices that are in that conflicting state, that's the real value, right? Everybody right. knows that when an IP address issue occurs, bandwidth and other things get messed up. But us telling you what the devices are is a real benefit. Now, Giancarlo, one more thing I want to say about this. Um, I want to make you guys aware of the fact that you do have the ability, Giancarlo, especially on systems that you own, like if I show my lab here, you can actually disable the alerts, right? Or you can get alerts when these things Yes, occur. yeah, disable or change the delivery mechanism. So uh, by default, this is the first, yeah, worth to mention, GP, that this is the only alert that Domots has enabled by, the, by default, because we believe it might be relevant to everybody. Uh, and the notification channel for the uh, the alert for the, the incident, the, the default notification channel is the email address of the admin account. So in your case, it's jpfowler at gmail. However, yeah. to your point, JP, yes, you can, one, disable that notification. If you don't care about the IP conflicts, you can disable that one. Or you can change the notification channel. Instead of sending an email to JP Fowler at Gmail, you can open a ticket on ConnectWise. You can send a notification on Slack or Teams and all the notification channels that we support. Perfect. And you were showing exactly where you can change that yeah. behavior. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, me meanwhile, I've grouped back together the two interfaces in the ATCHR uh, London uh, network. Yeah, you see no conflict. So real time. Yeah, real time. Garla, real time. Very good. Let's talk a little bit about DHCP requests. I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but again, um, the point being that if you have a system that is out there, if there are MAC addresses on the network that are making a lot of DHCP requests, and we're really doing this as a rate, right? The request per hour. Um, if you have a system that is doing that, it could just be the fact that your uh, lease time on your static res or on your uh, DHCP system is really low, right? Or it could be that you have a, a large number of devices that are sitting on that network. But Giancarlo, I mean, the point is, is that I think you have to look at this over time. And if you see drastic changes in the request rates, that's when you need to start worrying about that. Is there anything you wanted to add to this besides that before getting into the next step? Absolutely. So for the DHCP request, uh, one important change that we introduce in the in the domots behavior, and this speaks also to other development that we have done, is that we are constantly monitoring through a DHCP listener all the DHCP requests on the network, which means that we can identify the request done by any device that at a certain point gets the IP address, okay, and we can notify. So, for instance, if you look at the 559. Uh, uh, request per hour, yeah. that's a pretty high number. You can see that some of the devices, probably due to the list time, uh, are causing a lot of the of these uh, requests. Uh, but most importantly, we can also identify devices that never get an IP address on the network. Um, so, which means that there might be some devices that perform the HTTP request, but they never get an IP address either because the DHCP server doesn't provide the IP address or because it provides, but the device itself failed in using the IP address. So we can identify those devices. And that's a new thing we will show later today, uh, GB, because uh, it's important to know that, that we can now identify those kind of devices by the mean of uh, just the MAC address. And Giancarlo, for some of the network stuff here, I want to talk a little bit about buffer bloat. Um, I find buffer bloat to be uh, Kind of humorous. I think a lot of uh, you know network people um, may or may not be aware about it. They understand the fundamentals of it. I will say that gamers right know about it quite a bit. Um, but now we've improved this. We're actually putting grades on the buffer bloat, which I think is what people understand a little bit more. The point I want to say about buffer bloat is this is really a way for you as a service provider to help improve your customers' networks. Um, you know, you guys are, are implementing a service for these customers and having a system that actually grades or helps you measure performance of 
your customer's network and then giving you a way in which you can improve that, I think is what's so beneficial. Buffer bloat in short is the amount of jitter that occurs on a loaded network versus an unloaded network. And when you have a large delta in that jitter between a loaded and unloaded network, it means that your quality of service on that network, really at the firewall, at the router, is not performing the way it should. I'm happy to say that my network has an A. That's very exciting. Um, I have an A. Our, our, VIP, our VIP customer, though, not so good, right? Um, Giancarlo, what do you want to say about how... Uh, apart from it, having an F on my network, yeah, <laughs> job, yeah. Uh, I'm struggling in the configuring for those services uh, on my network. And th that's because I'm changing the gateway every now and then. So it's very, very unstable, that one. Um, so it's very important to know uh, what, what you mentioned, the unbalancing between when the load, the network is loaded and we artificially load the network to measure the uh, jitter, no? because we perform periodically speed tests on the network. So we are pushing data. So we can simulate the, a loaded network by doing the speed test and we measure the jitter at that time and we measure the jitter when there is no load. So that's how we understand that. Uh, by the way, JP, there is one competitor of your, uh, our colleague Eric has an A plus on his network. Oh. I don't know if he shares with you, uh, but that's great. That's okay. That's okay. He's an expert in networking, so I, I, I'm glad that he has an A+. So. Uh, and uh, similarly, so I think here, so similar to uh, to all the other uh, sensors that we have added, like the Active Conflict, the HPC request, you can set up an alert so that you receive a notification if something goes bad. Um, for instance, you lose mm -hmm. the configuration of the quality of service, uh, you want to be notified either through email, Slack notification teams or ConnectWise or Synchro uh, ticket. Um, another thing I want to mention there is that uh, it provides also an indication of the time, but there is also details. So if you click on the on the arrow, there is also details about the quality of service, how we measure, which are the baseline value on which we use to provide grade A to this network. There is also a link to a user guide to learn more. Um, if you click now. There is an issue with the with the link that it, it's missing a hash hash uh, tag. So yeah. if you click on that one, it will be fixed as of tomorrow. So that link will uh, will be fixed tomorrow. Great. Similarly, I want to mention another thing that will be fixed in the next few days. It going goes back to the IP conflict. Um, at the moment, there is the following uh, let's say somehow issue when we identify that two devices or two MAC addresses are using IP conflict, uh, sorry, are using the same, are using the same IP address, we raise no, the uh, incident and say there is a possibility of an IP conflict. Now, every one hour we check back if there is still the conflict and the current behavior is that we check once and if we fail in identifying two different devices or two different MAC addresses with the same, same IP address, we basically close the incident and we send a new notification saying no incident anymore, no IP conflict. And so this, this behavior is causing a lot of tickets for some of the network, like IP conflict detected and not detected, detected and not detected, every one hour you send a notification. This is going to be fixed in the next few days by basically doing a mechanism of retrying when we identify an IP conflict and we uh, after one hour, we identify that the epic conflict has disappeared. We retry multiple times before before saying the the, the IP conflict has been uh, not resolved. But it is correct That's to it. say that there's there's still this strong yeah. possibility of an IP conflict, right? In that absolutely, scenario. yeah, absolutely, yeah. Very good. Yeah. All right, Giancarlo. Uh, jitter, right? How, I mean, jitter is obviously a part of the buffer bloat, but this is actually, I mean, talk to me about what this jitter number is for. So it's basically a direct information that we provide um, to the user about the baseline jitter that we can measure on the network. So um, when you click on the buffer bloat with all the information, we provide the round trip delay when the network is loaded, but also the route replay when the network is unloaded. But when we load the network, we basically measure the route replay and therefore the jitter, both in the upload uh, phase 
of data. So we are pushing data. The network is pushing data out of the on the one site on the on the on the cloud, or when we download the net the, the data. And so the jitter in this case is the only one which is when the network is unloaded. So it's basically the baseline. So setting an alert here is basically setting an alert on when the baseline is changed. Gotcha. I gotcha. So that's just a very good indication that something drastic or something significant within the network, right, as it relates to the router firewall and going out the gateway there, that something's going wrong, right? Yeah. So yeah, very, very good. Excellent. Okay. Um, I definitely encourage everybody to take a look at this particular dashboard, right? Start to play with it, use it in your labs, use it in your, your systems, and um, start to get a, a feeling for it. I think one of the most valuable things from a troubleshooting in the, right now is certainly that IP conflict, but also if you really are a managed service provider and you're providing a service to your customers, think about how you can leverage this buffer bloat to improve your service or your service offerings that you have to your customers. So very good, very good. I, I like the uh, the graphics behind i found yeah. that IQ. so if you do a search for buffer bloat right iq router actually has some really really good discussions about you know what's happening as well as what you need to change within your router right when it comes to quality of service so i encourage people to check out iq router and what they're doing yeah it's if i remember correctly it's also referenced by uh, from our user guide so yeah that's uh, that's a valid resource when they can get to it, when they can get to it. <laughs> when they can. <laughs> Very good. Let's talk about ConnectWise, right? And ConnectWise PSA, right? Formerly known as Manage, right? They keep changing their names, uh, which is fine. Um, Giancarlo, there are really two significant uh, things that I think we did here, uh, primarily around the configurations that uh, Manage allows or does. Um, from my perspective, one of the key benefits that I talked about quite a bit at IT Nation Connect um, with several of our, our partners and, and customers was the fact that now not only does Domotes raise tickets, right? We've been doing that, but now we can create configurations when new devices show up and associate that to that customer's account, right? Your customer's account, which in turn, I think helps you from a billing perspective. Right, so that's what I really like here. Um, Giancarlo, what's your thoughts on this? I know configs are quite complex, right? So we don't really have a demo environment to show this, but can you speak to how um, some of our customers are using this? Absolutely, I, I, I will talk about, yeah, I will talk about the configs and the synchronization. So, but I, I, I would like also to talk about the, the second item, which is the linking between the sure. databases and configuration. So, uh, ConnectWise Manage or PSA uh, is a huge platform, uh, highly customizable. Uh, and within the platform, you have the concept of configuration, which is basically every entity that uh, will provide information to your company uh, as a, a technical um, technology service provider about what you care for your customers, which are the entities configuration basically that you care about the, the your customer. And so far it's um, a manual process where you create your own configuration or you inject from an Excel file, a CSV file or through API through other platform. But basically from the Domot's point of view was a manual process where you identify a new security camera, you want to create that one as a configuration, your uh, PSA platform, and you were able to ent uh, enter that configuration there. Now, with the, this integration, you allow the, the Domots user, um, user and ConnectWise user, to create the configuration automatically from Domots. So Domots not uh, will uh, sync will uh, connect to ConnectWise PSA, create new entities configuration when yeah. something is detected in Domots, but also will keep these entities synchronized between the Domots platform and the ConnectWise. A PSA platform, so that if you enter nodes in, for instance, just to give an example, if you enter nodes in, in a ConnectWise, these nodes will be reflected in Domots. Similarly, yeah. if you if you enter like a location or type of device, this type of device will be reflected in ConnectWise. And uh, that, that two-way synchronization is just that to me is like so helpful, 
right, to, to our customers. Yeah, it's important to know that it's a bi-directional, so it's a two-way communication between Domots and Connect White and vice versa. Um, as opposed to other integration where one side of the integration is basically getting all the information from the other side. In our case, we are able to push configuration and push changes, but we are also able to get the changes. And the Domots user will be allowed to define which fields are driven by Domots and which fields are driven by ConnectWise. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, Giancarlo, correct me if I'm wrong here, but configs right within ConnectWise PSA are actually extremely powerful. They're extremely flexible. And therefore, there's a lot of complexity associated with you know, how the configs are set up by the service provider, but then how we integrate those. Um, I think we have some basic settings set up, but I want to point out that our support team, our onboarding team is ready to help with those integrations, correct? I mean, have you... That, that's a correct statement, should be, yeah. So we launched this, this integration one month ago. Uh, we are still getting some little feedback here and there to optimize this. As I was mentioning, ConnectWise is highly configurable and yeah. some edge cases might have been missed so far. But yeah, yeah, your point is very valid. So connect with our support team to raise any issue you might experience there. Yep, yep. We're always open to, to feedback on these things and how we can improve. The two-way synchronization that we do is is fairly complex, right? The fact that we do that, but that also means that, you know, we want to help you. So if you're having problems with it, please reach out to us. Yeah. Moving on, Giancarlo. Moving on. Oh, uh, by the way, we we I, I mentioned that we need to speak about the the connection between oh. tickets and configuration, yeah. which is the second part of the change that we we added there. So we had already an integration with ConnectWise PSA for the ticketing part, the incident management. Now, Domots is a, a monitoring solution. It identifies issue at the network level and until one month ago, we were able to open tickets, uh, uh, update tickets, and close tickets automatically in ConnectWise when something happened in Domots. But those tickets were just standalone tickets. There was no link to the configuration side in, of, of ConnectWise PSA. Um, now, with the, the update we released last month, we are able to not only open the ticket, but link the ticket to the related configuration. So for instance, uh, Configuration, there is a configuration change on the router. This opening ticket uh, on ConnectWise saying router XYZ has changed the configuration file. Now we can link this ticket to the configurations, and the name is uh, unfortunate here, but the configuration <laughs> entity in ConnectWise saying this is the router where the configuration has changed. Now, why mm -hmm. this link is relevant? to the ConnectWise user is because most of, our, of the PSA users are using the configuration to create billing items to their customers saying, okay, on item X, Y, Z, we have done some work, like the configuration change that I was mentioning, or we had to reboot the switch because it was not performing appropriately and something like that. So thanks to this link, now you, at the end of the month, you can generate a report saying, what happened on your on the device that you care for your customers which i've always said right communications with your customer is critical right this is just another way in which you can show that domotes as a tool inside your software stack is actually working for you right to help create billing events or at least create communications into your customers about what you are doing for them right so i'm, I'm glad you mentioned that uh and and talked about the linking of that so good you ready to talk about some of the new developments that we've done? Let's, Other new developments? Let's dive into that. <laughs> we never we never stop developing, which I love. But uh, DHCP discovery, right? In fact, I'll bring up my screen here again, Giancarlo. If you want to start talking about what we yeah. have done here, that's a, so, that somehow we mentioned before when we were talking about the DHC, DHCP request that we measure, no? Uh, we talk about we can measure the HTTP request from every single device that is performing the request on the network because we have a listener basically on the network. Um, and we can associate 
the uh, request to a specific device already having an IP address on the net. Now, since we are listening at the DHCP level, we can also identify devices that they never get an IP address on the net. Which means we are not actively monitoring, you cannot ping that device, you cannot perform an SNMP request to that device because it does not have an IP address, but we can identify that there is something trying to connect to your network. Yep. So by enabling the, the device discovery via the HTTP, we allow the users to identify this kind of devices. Uh, we, have a, we have seen, and probably have some example on our support line, we have seen networks where there are two or three devices per network, which are attempts to get an IP address on the network, but they got denied. And, and as I was mentioning before, it might be the DHCP that doesn't, the DHCP server that does not provide an IP address, or the device itself that failed in yeah. getting the IP address that has been provided. Giancarlo, is it is it reasonable to say, I mean, if you took a simple network and maybe you just provided your DHCP server with a range of only 50 addresses, if you had more than 50 devices trying to get an IP address from the DHCP server, this would actually be very valuable, right? Because right. it would show that there's, there's a whole bunch of MAC addresses sitting there at layer two looking to get to layer three, but they can't, right? Very good, correct assumption, JP. And this goes together with the table that we were showing before. You will see a high number of requests because it will try and retry and retry continuously, but it fails. So absolutely, yep. yeah, that's a correct assumption. Um, right. Yeah, not only that, also there are other cases where the device might be faulty and needs a restart because even though an IP address is provided to the device, it fails to use it. Yeah. To connect to the network. So there are multiple cases like that makes sense so you can say you can find this i don't know if everybody saw what i did there but if you go to your dashboard in your devices list on the right hand side there's device auto discovery click on that yeah. under the monitoring settings and that's where you'll find this and then you can enable this setting here so if I, if I remember correctly and this address one of the questions i see on the line uh, yeah. this is uh, enabled by default on all the new agents if i remember correctly um, there is not a way to enable massively on all the on all the agent, but if they drop an email to our support, I mean, if you have 100, 200 agents, uh, instead of doing one by one, if you drop an email to our support, we might be able to, um, to enable that for all your agents. Beautiful, good. Giancarlo, you know, we kind of grouped layer three discovery in Azure on this same bullet. Do you want to speak to that? Yes, uh, the, the layer three. Um, yeah. I was I was at answering a question on the, on the line. So, <laughs> sorry for that. Layer three discovery in Azure. Um, as probably all of you are aware, Domots is one of the, one of the unique capability of Domots, let's put in that way, is that, and we distinguish by other monitoring solutions that Domots discover networks on a layer two. So we identify devices starting from the layer two, which is the MAC address, physical address, okay? which is not my home address. It's the physical address. Um, and every single entity is uniquely identified by the physical address, which is the MAC address. Oops. If you have a device which has two network interfaces, as we've shown before, you can group them together because they are technically speaking, they're the same device with two network interfaces. So with two different MAC addresses, you can group together. So the entity is, uh, is one. But again, the unique identifier for pinging a device, for discovering uh, SNMP, UPnP, all the other devices, starts from the MAC address. Now, majority of network, including virtual networks like um, AWS, has this concept of uh, layer two, even if it's virtual in uh, AWS, which allows you to discover all the virtual machine on uh, AWS by the MAC address, even though it's a random MAC address. Azure, on the other hand, has a different concept of virtual network where basically every single virtual machine on the virtual, virtual network has the same MAC address of the gateway, which calls the domot agent with its, its default configuration to 
not be able to discover the virtual uh, net, a virtual device, or sorry, the virtual machine on that network. Because in uh, Azure, Azure, they are identified by the IP address and not by the network. So basically what we enabled uh, a couple of months ago, and now we are announcing that, is the possibility to configure the domotz agent so that even on the attached network, so a network interface that this uh, recognized as attached to the machine hosting the domotz agent, we enable a discovery by IP address, which is a discovery by layer three. We are able to do that so that you can discover virtual machine on Azure. We basically enable the what we call the routed subnet discovery mechanism, even on local networks. Yeah. I don't know if that if I was clear. It's a, yeah. no. a difficult concept, but it, it is a difficult concept. But I want to I want to point out to I mean, and you you correct me if I'm wrong, but as we as service providers, as our customers are dealing more and more with cloud networks, whether they're hosted by AWS or they're hosted by Microsoft, right, in the Azure environment or Google or wherever, right? We're giving everybody the tools here to be able to look at these cloud environments, right? Look at these machines that are out there, discover them, right? Um, beyond just the, the standard capabilities that are out there. In my mind, this is a great uh, addition and we're, we're going to continue to look at how we improve our cloud monitoring which and speaking of cloud monitoring Giancarlo one of the things that we did here um, and as we've added more and more custom scripts for monitoring Azure right for doing SNMP monitoring it's just kind of extending that capabilities uh, and visibility into these systems do you want to speak to some of the new scripts that we've added and does it help uh, if we go to the, yeah the, we can we can go to the uh, user guide where we see the release notes. In every release note, so you can also speak about the release notes, or if you look at the I can do that. but some of them are not there. Yeah. I like this, to look this, at this number, right? Because this number keeps growing by 10 or 20 every uh, every month. So um, I know that this is what I like to look at, but you want me to go find the release notes? Yeah, so that we also educate some some of the, the folks on the, on the, uh, on the webinar today, how to read the release notes. Um, yeah. Because it's a quite intense work. I mean, uh, to your point, JP, we release, we release new feature, uh, new integration, new SMP template every single week. However, we yeah. update the release notes once per month, just to, let's say, group things together. Um, so once per month, you will receive an email with the highlights of new feature, new improvements, new announcements in the product, but we will also have information about the new templates that have been added, the new integration script that have been added there. So uh, if you- I should go, actually show it on the screen, right? right? So people can see. Yeah, so if you go to help.domotes.com and release notes. Yeah, right? so let, let's get the last one that it was from last week, for instance. Uh, of course, there, there is a, there is there are areas like the what's new uh, and then what's improvement and so on. But within the new things, you will find a section dedicated to new scripts and new SNMP templates. Yeah. Uh, so of course, the network troubleshooting was there. But if you scroll down to the new script, custom script, it talks about which are the custom scripts we have added. These last months, we focused on a couple of uh, uh, innovation on the uh, network instead. In particular we are getting a stronger and stronger relationship with the Sonic Wall guys. Um, we are working together with their product management to get inf more information out of the devices through multiple means, SNMP, as well as API, as well as uh, uh, Telnet or SSH, if, if we connect to the Sonic Wall devices in that way. Uh, in this particular case, we are speaking about uh, custom script that, I, if I remember correctly, they use the API the Sonic OS API to extract information like which are the VN, VPN session uh, enabled, which are the VPN session which are currently running. What we will add there more, which is specifically for the Sonic wall, is a security stance. So we will provide uh, like a, a small table saying, okay, your security um, posture is correct because uh, two-factor authentication is enabled and uh, this other setting is enabled and so on. So that's something that we are adding there. 
the the security okay. posture thing i find extremely interesting right i mean as as more and more service providers even custom integrators right are having to worry about cybersecurity and how they're handling it i mean for us to kind of look at the system configuration and then be able to assess right how the security footprint is I, I think is extremely beneficial on this. And this is just some of the directions that we're going. And SonicWall has some of this already and being able to bring that out into your monitoring platform. And again, set alerts, create tickets based off of changes in your footprint, I think are pretty darn cool there. So yeah. good, 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 good. So anything else in the release notes, Giancarlo, you think I should point out here? Yeah, so the other area of improvements is SNMP template. Again, we have some part there for the Sonic wall, uh, but another template we have just released, and this again brings some awareness of firmware version, CPU usage, and so on. And the other one is on Juniper. So in Juniper, we are extracting the serial number through SNMP again. Um, now, unfortunately, serial number is not uh, as uh, standard in, in SNMP as other information. Yeah. Like apparently the location is a standard, but not the serial number. So depending on the, the device, we need to extract the serial number from a different OID, so the object identifier. So, so uh, this is just, going to this is the direction that we're going, right? And this is a capability. Um, some of these SNMP templates can be modified, right, to meet the customer's need. But it's also important to point out in the serial number side, which I think we're going to talk about it again, if you need to edit this, right, to actually reflect what it is your system is using or however you handle serial numbers, you can do that and then it synchronizes with your documentation tool. That's well. a correct statement, yeah. Uh, which speaks also to the other item that probably is in the same slide. Uh, um, let's look at uh, yeah, yeah serial, serial, number. <laughs> serial number. Yeah, we have focused more and more in the last few weeks and months on collecting serial number uh, out of uh, uh, devices from different nature, no? networking devices, security system, um, I don't know, point of sale system, and so on. Um, we are the serial number might be retrieved from SNMP as we saw for Juniper, for instance, but might be retrieved from API, might be retrieved from an SSH command and so on. We are going to standardize uh, the, uh, not the way we retrieve the, the, the information, but the way we store the, the, the information in DOMOTS so that it can be used for linking DOMOTS or in, integrate DOMOTS with the documentation system, yeah. which are, we are already doing. Uh, in the way we extract this information in Excel spreadsheet, in the way we can search for a specific serial number from the inventory tab, you have this capability today. But what it is even more important, and this is the direction we're going, we are going to add the capability. And I'm I'm sorry if uh, I spoil some of the future development JP. We are going to talk later, but time is going. Um, we are going to integrate with systems that will be able to provide us with a lifetime, uh, sorry, life cycle of the device itself, starting from serial number, like warranty period. So uh, for how long this Cisco switch is, uh, is under warranty, two months, three months, whatever, so that you can set up an alert and get the notification if this warranty is going to reach the end of life. All those systems track off of serial numbers, right? Not not necessarily MAC addresses, right? So that's that's why we're we're pushing. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly the why, JP. You you yeah. said it correctly. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. So the last one, the last one, Giancarlo, in this section, and I uh, need to go a little bit quickly just because of our issue we had at the beginning. But custom metric or cust the metrics, excuse me, metrics and how they get used, right? Because that's something that, you know, people, I think, people that have been with us for a while, uh, they probably remember the days of eyes, right? And SNMP and TCP sensors, right? And the changes there. Now we have this thing called metrics, right? And counters. Um, it may look like we've done a reduction of the number of sensors, but in reality, we've actually significantly improved um, what we've done here with respect to these metrics. Um, Giancarlo, can you speak to 
why the change and what we're doing with these counters and how we're how we're addressing this. Absolutely, JB. Yeah, and thanks for pointing it out that from externally, it might seem like we have reduced the number or, or the capability that you have on your domo decision. But let me provide you an example uh, which explains why we have done this change. So in the past, with the eyes, uh, we were basically counting every single variable that uh, you were measuring through domots and the capability of a specific agent was also related to the frequency we were uh, basically collecting this information. Now, let's go to the example. Let's imagine I have, just to simplify, let's imagine I have a network switch with 10 network ports. For every single port, we extract uh, 13 variables. Uh, incoming, outgoing uh, traffic, incoming, outgoing errors, incoming, outgoing packet loss, um, MTU, and so on. So 13 metrics, okay? What we had in the past, if we were, if you were adding or if you were extracting this information every 30 minutes, we were counting 13 columns by 10 rows, which are the network ports. So 130 uh, sensors or variables every 30 minutes. And you had the like limit of, I don't remember the exact number, like 900 right. Right, every 30 minutes. Now, if you wanted to scan every 15 minutes, the limit was uh, the half of 900, 450. And then if you wanted to scan every five minutes, it was a third of that one. So it was 150 and so on and going down. So you could recognize that with, with the scan every five minutes, you could only monitor one single switch of 10 ports because it's 130 variable, no? Now, no. with the change we introduce in the counting the metrics, we are not counting every single variable in this huge table. We are only counting the metrics, the, the columns that you oh. care about. So for a one single switch, we only count 13 metrics, regardless how many ports they have. Now imagine a, a network switch, uh, sorry, a stack switch of three physical 48 ports. Yeah. That's 100, whatever, 130 uh, <laughs> columns, uh, rows, okay? But most importantly, we do not change the uh, amounts that you can monitor on the sample period. So right. regardless of your sample time, you can put two minutes, you will still have the same capability. So the reality, the reality of this whole thing and what I hear you saying, Giancarlo, is that we've given people the ability to look at the columns, right? The information of data, right? Whether it's you know, up, down status, inbound, outbound traffic, right? They're really looking at that across the switch, but they can do it faster, right? More frequent. And when they have larger switches, right? They get a lot more data, right? And it doesn't cost them anything, right? So Correct. that I think is a significant improvement here. And when you're using the templates that we're providing with this information, you really get to take advantage of, of these metrics. Correct. So and you so can go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. You can. I was going to say you you can still go in and add custom SNMP sensors, right? If you want to look at very specific OIDs, right, and read from those and sample from those, then yes, it consumes a metric. But we actually think that your ability to look at this at a table level, but then also be able to set alerts on each one of these from the pre-configured templates is just a huge benefit, right? So. I think uh, these yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, now it's also worth to mention specifically to the network interface, these same information are also available in the interface tab. It's a different format, uh, but the information are there. So if you don't care about the alerting, if you don't care about specific uh, yeah. let's say graph of something that you want to monitor there, you can basically just avoid adding the template there. You have the information anyway. So, yeah. and this is included, in, which means that we are not counting that against the the, the capability of your real Very good point, yeah. very good point. Yeah, I mean, if you're just interested in having historical information about what's going on that port, actually just using the interfaces tab is fine. Correct, Correct. So. it's exactly the same source of information. Different sample period, but basically the same source of information. Right. Worth to mention that, GB, that yeah. we changed yeah. also recently in terms of metric count, counter is also on the custom scripts. 
So in the custom script on the integration that we provide the script for, if we create a table for the same reason, instead of, uh, of counting every single entity in the table, we only count and we measure the columns of the table, the huge table. Just to give an example, if you are if you were monitoring uh, uh, SSL certificate, the duration, expiration, the issue, and so on, it's three columns, three, four columns. In the past, the, the amount of uh, um, metrics you were consuming was these four columns by the number of certificates you care, 10, 20, 40. Now, we only count four, which are yep. the four entities that you are, you are willing to care about. Such a good point. Such a good point, Giancarlo. Um, in the interest of time, um, we're not going to go over all the features of the Channel Partner Program again. We, this is actually the same slide we had before, but we added two bullets um, because of feedback that we had gotten during some of our phone calls. And, and Giancarlo, I'd like to speak to this a little bit. Um, I mentioned this already. If you haven't joined the Channel Partner Program, please do. Right? I want you guys um, in there. Um, it's a way for us to actually partner together and help each other, right? We're doing this because of kind of these last two bullets, right? First of all, um, we think that this network troubleshooting has been very successful and the people that got access to the beta of that when they're in the channel partner program, we're very excited about that. Now everybody has that and I think it helped us to improve the quality of the product that we, we released. Um, I'm gonna tell you that there are more betas coming up and we'll talk about that on the next slide. But by all means, um, if we have that tighter relationship through the channel partner program, that's going to be what gives you access to that. We've also introduced this notion of alignment meetings. You know, you may think of it as a QBR or a business review. Um, we want to make sure that Domotes is meeting your needs, right? If you're going to put us as a tool into your stack of tools that you use to service your customers, we want to make sure that you know we're meeting your expectations and we're meeting your needs. So part of being in this channel partner program is really getting us to listen to you individually about the things that you're doing. So we can set up, you know, whether it's 15 or 30 minute meetings with you, uh, we want to do that. And we have a team that's dedicated to doing that. I'd also point out, by the way, I just want to say this, Giancarlo, because this has been this has come up multiple times when we've talked to people that have joined. They want to have a discussion, a technical discussion about the features that we do. And we are very open to that. We have an onboard, onboarding team uh, that can help with that. Whether that means getting Domotes integrated into your software stack, right? The ticketing systems or the documentation systems, or just getting a better understanding of how we interface with different network platforms, the channel partner program provides you with access to that. So those are the things I wanted to say about this. Um, I think I think so far it's been successful. If you haven't joined on it, please go to um, the channel partner program section in portal.domotes.com right in your account and sign up for it. So yeah, that's a correct statement, GP. So sign up from the portal. We will take it from there. Um, one thing uh, I want to mention of everybody because it's here. Uh, if if uh, if you apply for the channel partner program you will receive a ticket from our ticketing system make sure you whitelist our support at domos.com your mailing server uh, hmm. because that's something that i've realized that in the last few weeks or months somebody has raised the point that our email is going is hitting their um, junk folder um, i want to make sure that you receive those emails we are very um, I mean, we are proud to be very fast in answering to every ticket, but especially this uh, channel partner program ticket. So, yeah, make sure you whitelist our our email there. A good point, Giancarlo. Very good point. We'll take from there. And uh, as JP was mentioning, it, it's in our interest to schedule a call as soon as possible with you to understand your requirements. What you care about Domos? Sorry, what you care about the network and how Domos can help you achieve what you care about there. So, good. Okay, well, I mentioned I mentioned this whole beta thing, right? And let's talk about some of our near-term focus items, but then also talk about this uh, cloud beta. We didn't talk about Glasswire at all this time, whereas on the last call, 
we had some discussions. I shall, I should, Giancarlo, I should have probably put the glass wire thing first because I want to talk about that beta thing first. Um, we've had quite a bit of feedback with respect to glass wire. Um, I feel like all the feedback has been very positive. Um, I think everybody has a really good understanding about what we're doing with Glassware, at least for the people that we, we talk to. Um, just as a reminder, the Glasswire is an endpoint application that's essentially running on your, your Windows machine. And it is looking at the applications that are running. It's effectively, from our point of view, looking at the bandwidth being consumed by those applications. Of course, it also can act as kind of a personal firewall. So if you need to disable applications, you can do that. If you want to set them up on schedules, you can do that as well, or at least within, um, well, I'm not thinking of the right word right now, but being able to have kind of a, say, a personal firewall versus a business firewall and have those things turned on and off um, as needed, you can do that. The one common feedback that we've gotten, Giancarlo, and, and you and I are both very well aware of this, is while that information is great sitting on the PC and the graphical user interface is beautiful, people really want to bring that information into the cloud, right, into the Domotes environment. And from my point of view, that's exactly where we're going. And I think over the next three to six months, right, in the 2Q, by the 2Q timeframe, we're going to have that hopefully released. Um, all that depends on how well this beta goes. Right, so Giancarlo, do you want to mention anything about or beyond what I've said here on Glasswire and how we're bringing that into the Domotes environment? Yeah, so uh, you said something, uh, Chibi. You know, currently, the Glasswire application is really an endpoint application, a standalone application. There is very little value to the Domotes user apart from managing the fleet of uh, um application glassware application running in every single endpoint and managing means that i know that this endpoint is covered by glassware or that this endpoint is not covered by glassware but the information is not is not collected in the cloud yet yep. so what we are going to do and this is something that is coming in the next few weeks so be ready uh, we are going to get the information about which are the application running on every single endpoint which are the applications that are generating traffic on every single endpoint, which are the applications that are generating traffic to Italy from all the endpoints that I manage as an MSP or technology service provider. And this is the first step, but we also are going to enable users to, to your point, JP, to block. I want to block all the applications that are generating traffic. Yeah, yep. So it becomes, it becomes a policy tool, right? Correct. So as service providers are adding policies in place, it's another way of checking that, which I, I absolutely love. So yeah, yeah, good, 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 good. Let me, Giancarlo, let's talk quickly about custom scripts. Uh, I was that... going to add something, something more there because it's oh, also something that I would like to have some interest and some beta tester there, and a reason for having more dormant channel partner program. Uh, one of the capabilities we are enabling just for glass wire for business and not for the glass wire, the consumer um, edition. So the glass wire for business is going to partnership with an alliance that provides a rating on the quality of the traffic that it's generated. Quality in terms of risk of the endpoint that, you're, you're, that your application is connecting to. Like from a scale from zero to 10, every single connection to yeah. an out, outgoing connection will be rated by the risk of like a uh, risk of eight, uh, and the Domus user will be able to set a policy again to block proactively all the attempts, not the connection, the attempts to connect to an yeah. endpoint which is rated more than eight. It's the attempt. It's very important that. Yeah. That gets to that security posture, security footprint, like we were talking about with respect to sonic calls and stuff. That's such a critical part of what service providers are monitoring. And us adding a tool like that that gives that capability, I think, is very, very powerful. Yeah, I agree. The point being, right, join the channel partner program so you can help us out with some of this. And if you have input, right, if you have thoughts, we want to hear about that. So um that that's what that partner program is about let's last last thing we want to talk about custom scripts 
right? Um, yeah. We've continued to improve that, but I am super excited about the discussions we had. We alluded a little bit to this before um, with respect to some of the frameworks that we're building for the custom scripts. Um, in particular, right, we're very focused on configuration management. So Giancarlo, from your point of view, what does that mean for our end users? So for the for the end user and also our, let's say, partners or, or companies we work closer with, um, means that we are going to enable, um, let's say, simple developers to extract information out of the device they care and store this information as a sort of backup. So we have created a framework internally to, uh, to Domots, which uh, is called configuration management or backup and batch on control of every file. Um, and currently we develop built-in drivers to connect to the Juniper system, to connect to the Cisco iOS or Cisco Catalyst, to connect to the Fortinet devices, extract the configuration file, store in Domot, and then every uh, periodically we store a new version. If there is any change, we highlight the change and we notify the, the user that there is a change in the file. So we are basically opening this framework to every user to write their own script to get a file stored yep. in, the, in our database and then get a new snapshot, check if there is a difference, if there is a difference, alert the user. And also a possibility to push a new, not a new configuration in the system uh, as well. So we are going to enable this through a JavaScript framework again. I love it. So this in theory could be used for web servers. This can be used for IoT devices, right? As long as the manufacturer or the system that's out there has a means of downloading really data, right? We have a way of checking against it, right? So I'm I'm super stoked about this and, and what we're doing there. And I'm I'm glad that we focused on this because quite frankly, you know, being able to back up data to the cloud for these systems has been um, something that's been requested for a while. And the fact that we're putting it in a framework is beautiful. Giancarlo, we're out of time. I know that um, our team has been in the background answering a lot of questions. I think most of the comments came from the fact that um, I clearly don't know how to operate go to webinar, even though I've been doing it for like six years now. So uh, hopefully the team got to you. Um, just in the interest of time, we will address some of those questions uh, via email. Get those out. I apologize for you know what ended up being about an eight to ten minute delay. Embarrassing, totally embarrassing. But I am really grateful that you guys stuck around with us. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you in 2024. So thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks a lot, guys.